smoke at the very bottom and then we'd open the top and smoke a couple in there. And if, if you do that and do it right, could you hand me a frame of wax? You're going to be pulling a frame like this out and that shows the, uh, the wax after, as they build it on here. The darker area is where they have stored, they've actually had brood and Babies, raised their eggs. Babies, yeah. Yes, and the lighter colored comb is where they store, and they usually do that. They just, they'll store their food close. They'll have a, a, a rim of honey above the brood nest. And on this side, you can see even just a little bit, there's a few cap cells there where they've didn't re the brood didn't hatch out. And again, there was honey around the outside. And an empty one. This oh. is what we put in the hive when we start out, is the one, is a foundation. We're using a wood frame here with a piece of plastic foundation that we just snap in into place when we're working with it. So we buy these two pieces individual. There's 10 frames in each box of bees. Each hive? Uh, actually, we use, here in the north, we usually use 20. We have, we have two boxes, one above each other. Let's see the box. Uh, Lori's, Lori, Terry's holding the uh, box. This is what a, a, a bee box looks like. And this is the new all plastic frame that they've come out with that we don't have to assemble. And all the bees care is that we get a uniform coating of wax over this plastic and then they will draw, they will turn it into, into something that looks like this. In the center of this frame, there is, there is we started out with a, with a hard plastic. And the reason why we've done that, gone to the plastic, is because it stands up better to bear attacks and it stands up better in our in our actual extractors. When we put this when we put a frame in, they set in a circle and the centrifugal force throws the honey out. If you were able to see this frame of wax carefully, the bees when they build it, they slant all the cells are slanted up so that as they're putting honey in, the uh, the honey won't run back out because of the way the, the uh, cell is, <coughs> is slanted. So if we tip it up on its side, or this way, the honey would drip out. Putting it on its side like this and then spinning it extracts the honey. Now how much honey do you get out of uh, one of those? This large deep would probably have around 70 pounds of honey if it was filled. Seven pounds? 70. Oh, seven, that, that one box? Yes, if it was filled with honey. Now what we use, is we use a, a medium super, which is only seven and five eighths, where that one is nine and five eighths, and a medium will ho can hold around 40 to, 50, 40 to 50 pounds of honey. That's an awful lot of honey then. Now, They're heavy. They're heavy. They hurt your back. How much can you take without hurting the bees? Uh, we never take any honey out of the bottom two supers. So you just take it from the top? We take from the top. Now, I have extracted two mediums off from some of our hives already. They've filled out that much. It's been a very good bee year. And healthy bees make a lot more honey than unhealthy ones do, obviously. Uh, the, the state average is around 60 pounds of honey per hive extract, extracted from a hive for the whole year. Normally, we extract this time of year some, we've ex been extracting a little bit. When we come off from apples, we wanted to pull our apple honey, so we s extracted that and sold it. And then we extract white clover and other honeys now in the first two weeks of July. We'll be going through everything because if we don't extract our honey in July, what will happen is they will, they, one, one thing they'll do is they'll mix it with goldenrod and other honeys and then we just have a generic honey. We like to, we like to save the flavors for our, for our, beekeepers or our people who are buying the honey. If we take this one here, this this is simply goldenrod. That's the fall honey. And it's kind of, you know, it's a really smooth honey, but the honey that we take during take off during the summer has a has a more fruitful flavor because it may have apples or we were down in the fruit belt doing peaches or strawberries or something like that. And we'll pick that that taste up when a when a like if I take bees to Florida, for instance, and make orange blossom honey, it's going to taste a lot different than the uh, 
Well, also local we, honey. We have the uh, super honey around here is the locust honey, right? Yes. Now our locusts. That's one of the reasons when we like to get off from pollinate, pollinating the apples and things in the spring, move the hives to locust groves, and our locust honey is just really, really flavorful. Unfortunately, this spring we had a freeze that that uh, kind of wrecked that. We didn't get much locust honey. It's a, anybody who smelled a locust grove, you know what he's talking about. It's fantastic. What a fragrance just floating down around you. Um, grapes, do they give you any honey? Bees don't usually work grapes, uh. and sometimes they don't work corn. We hope we try to keep them from working corn because if they're forced to work corn, they don't make a lot of honey from it. Corn has uh, the corn pollen, even though there's a tremendous amount of corn pollen, and it bothers a lot of people with sneezes and stuff, it doesn't have a lot of sugar in it. The plant, the corn plants tends to sort sugar in the leaves and the, and the ear of the corn. Now, for farm crops, clover and alfalfa make a tremendous, tremendous honey. Yeah, clover honey is. So we like to keep our bees where they're pollinating clover and, uh, you know, alfalfa or, you know, at that time of the year, uh, apples and all that stuff are long since gone. Um, but here in Chautauqua County, we, you know, we do need bees to pollinate for our fruit trees and our flowers and vegetables and uh, setting the seeds on clover and things like that. Okay. Now, um, you said you had about 100 bees, uh, I should say 100 hives. How about the hives that uh, uh, swarm? You've told me that they swarm. Now, now suddenly you've got double the hive, right? If you can catch the yes, swarm? Yes, yes. See, what will happen is the season goes along. Uh, we start out with a package of bees or we start out with a split, which is just a few frames put into a hive and, and with a queen. And as that queen matures and gets older and gets that box totally full of honey, the, um, the older queen will leave the hive with the, with the flying workers and that's called a swarm. It'll land at a tree or something visible for a while while they find a suitable place to go to, like a tree or hopefully one of my bait hives that I've set out. That's, that's yeah. what we prefer is that they don't run off into the wild, that we get to keep them. And that, that essentially is their way of making a, a split or a second hive and increasing their population. How do you induce them to go to your hive? I put a little bit of wax in there, then it smells like home. Uh, Sometimes we spray a little lemon oil, or occasionally people will put a little bit of honey in, a, in there, but that, that'll only work if you know you've got a swarm coming right away. If you don't, if uh, you put honey in there and it goes two or three weeks, ants and things like that are gonna get in there and, and take, the honey out, take the honey out. So that's counterproductive. But if you know you've got a swarm coming right away, then you could put a little bit of honey in it, it would work, work great. Uh, I wonder if there's any way to tell the swarm's about to form. Uh, sometimes there is. If we see queen cells when we inspect a hive, we know she's the old queen's going to leave, have to leave because she will leave before the uh, new queen hatches because if there's two queens in a hive, they'll fight. And one kills the other. Yes, that's, yes. That's what happens. Uh, so she leaves several behind, doesn't she? And they have to kill them off, each other off. Yes, when, when a queen leaves, you're right. When a queen leaves, there's usually several queen cells that are about an inch long hanging off the sides of the frames, look like a peanut almost, and the first one of those to hatch will usually go around and, and kill the rest of the uh, queen cells out so that there's only her left and then she has to fly and mate. And that causes a problem for a beekeeper because sometimes when that virgin queen flies to mate, she doesn't get back to the hive because a bird will catch her or she'll get caught out in a storm. If she doesn't make it back, then that that hive no longer has a chance to draw any more queen cells and the hive will end up queenless and that's when we have to requeen a hive is if something goes wrong in nature. So the hive must have a queen. Now the one queen popula populates the entire hive, right? Yes, that, that queen that, that's... They're all her, all her daughters. All uh -huh. she does is lay eggs all day long uh -huh. and she can lay a frame like I showed you earlier in a day. Wow. During, during the peak honey flow, when they're bringing lots of pollen and lots uh -huh. of nectar in, she can, she can lay all day long, and she can literally lay one side of that a day. Now, uh, another question I have is, uh, how, does, how long does she lay eggs? I mean, how, how long is she good for? Does she have to be re-fertilized or anything, or what? 
Uh, queens never refertilize. They never. The only time they fly is for their mating flight, and then they fly when they leave the hive to make a new swarm. And unfortunately, when my father was keeping bees, uh, queen would last four or five years. Today, they only last for up to two years, and and they just aren't lasting like they used to. And it's part of our disease problem. And every time a, a swarm swarms, there's that danger that the new queen won't won't uh, get fertilized and back to the hive. And so that's part of our colony collapse disorder, I think, is the fact that queens don't last as long as they used to. And and we are, we do, as beekeepers, try to requeen now once a year. Okay, requeen. Now, how do you requeen? Well, what I'll do is I'll either buy queen cells from a queen breeder down south if I want them early in the spring, or I will, ma if my hives are really strong and I have empty boxes, I will pull five frames out of the ten, put it into a new box, give them five more frames of empty, of empty new frames, and they will, st if they have eggs, they will start a new swarm. Just like that? Yeah, they, w in the absence of a queen, they will draw a queen cell, and it really works best if you take, if it's a beginner. I'll tell you this, if you're a beginner, it works best to take the old queen out of the big box and put her in the new box and let her start over again, leaving one day old eggs in the, in the old box so that the old, old hive will recognize that they don't have a queen within 12 hours and they'll immediately start to, fer to feed the, the larva that's one, day, one, one to three days old. They'll feed that a lot of extra royal jelly and grow their own new queen. So they just create a queen um, by what they feed them. Feed yes, they do. Yes, oh. if they they'll feed. I don't know the numbers, but I think it's five five times more feed to a to a queen cell to grow a queen as opposed to just a worker cell. They feed that much more feed to them and that much more protein, and then that's how the the, the queen grows larger. But where does she get the semen? The uh she gets that from the drones when she, she makes her mating flight. Oh, so she has to take a flight first. They have to fly to mate. Yeah, and then uh, they get mated and then they mm -hmm. come back and hopefully come back. <laughs> yeah, the biology of, the, of this whole process would be that the worker bees would start fertili fertilizing or feeding, start feeding is the right word, the, the uh, queen cell, the, the, the young egg, and they would feed that very strongly for the first seven days and then they would turn around and and feed the uh, you know cap it off and she would hatch at four, the 14 to 16 day mark and five days later she'd fly to me okay we have a telephone call uh, caller thank you for calling and waiting good morning good morning good morning what's up um well first off i want to mention that uh as it happens annually this year the um uh, firemen of westfield are having their big fundraiser this weekend and uh, the Oxrose is going to take place Sunday. And in the meantime, there's lots of excitement in the village because a lot of the classes choose to have their class reunions, if I, you know, uh, on this weekend. So. Well, thank you for reminding us. The Oxrose is uh, basically a huge village party, and uh, you get these delicious Oxrose sandwiches, and there's. There's beverages and beer and, and uh, all kinds of Don't forget the curly fries. And the curly fries and the Belgian uh, waffles and all kinds of wonderful food and dancing and singing and usually they have a band there and it's just fantastic. What a day. The whole village comes down and people from around come and uh, all the class reunions occur on this weekend. Now today on Saturday, most class reunions are recovering from their picnic last night. Tonight they will have a formal dinner somewhere in a restaurant usually, and then tomorrow they'll go down to the Ox Roast and convene there, and everybody gets to see everybody they haven't seen for years. And the class of 1960, who had their 50th class reunion two years ago, decided that we shouldn't wait that long between class reunions. So some ambitious, uh, one of the uh, uh, members of the class suggested that we have a 70th birthday. <laughs> reunion. Well, so and this is our this year's our 70th birthday for most of us. Uh -huh. So we uh, this that class is having a 70th birthday reunion, and uh, uh, the many many of the members are making it home for it. Yeah, well, that's terrific. Uh, my class of 57, uh, very a lot of people from Westfield are still there, and like me, hanging out and loving it. That's uh, Jimmy Sanderson, Howie Haskins, and Diane and Pete. 
uh, Holt, uh, Pete was our president, and uh, we had a big bash for the 50th, and it's, it's, it's a little quieter now because uh -huh. we're, <laughs> uh -huh. we're getting old. <laughs> I'm 73 now, you know, and that's the way it is. <laughs> But uh, we will still, as long as we can stumble around, have reunions, I'm sure. Of course. Now, I do have a question.